Hey, movie fans, and welcome back to another episode of the Uncharted Media Podcast. This is episode 208, and once again, waiting on you, James Gunn, like, uh, <laughs> holding up the show here, you're running out of yeah. days, you, you said it was in January, um, let's improvise another discussion topic here, because <laughs> new movie news is incredibly slow, as you'll get to as we'll talk about the quote-unquote movie news of the past week uh and in our discussion this week we have some the batman related news and we also have some news about something else that's kind of adjacent to a movie that will be in our discussion so we're just like you know what that's been on our back pocket for a little bit let's just talk about things that are pretty looking best looking <laughs> movies so what do we mean by that it's not necessarily like cinematography it's that could factor in to it but it could be a combination of cinematography, production design, cool shots in the movie. Just overall, what are some movies that were just like, oh, that's nice. That looks, that's, that's pretty. That's what, what are some movies that are really just nice to look at, have beautiful mm -hmm. shots. Mm -hmm. If you could take a still from that movie and go, yep, that's a banner somewhere. That could be artwork somewhere on my wall for almost the entire movie. It's not like snapshots that we did that episode, but like the whole movie more or less has to be a beautiful collage of wonderful images. They don't have to always have to be the best movie, as we'll, I'm sure we'll discuss <laughs> in certain movies. Uh, yeah, that's the keys today. <laughs> Michael Bay has made a formula out of style over substance, but uh, I don't have any Michael Bay movies, actually. But Same. But yeah, we're talking about the best-looking movies. What's, what's the visual eye candy? What utilizes the film medium the best of, ooh, that's purdy. Uh, speaking of purdy, Josh, how you doing tonight? <laughs> Today's episode of Where Is Josh Now? Because <laughs> I'm always recording from somewhere different, apparently. Uh, I'm actually in my office today, so this is kind of nice. An upgrade from the back of your car. <laughs> Jeez, it's still hilarious to think about that, like me sitting in my car, using sitting the, in the, the parking jobs. lot of a yeah. gym to use their Wi-Fi. <laughs> That's all. It's it's hilarious. It's so funny to see how far we've come. Um, but yeah, man, like it's it's been it's like a slow week for news. I mean, I literally I I have <laughs> Nate's been laughing at me all week because it's become very very blatantly blatantly obvious that I'm enjoying being on Twitter, um, which is like something I never thought I would say. Uh, but I subscribe like I have the little alerts for James Gunn's um, Twitter because obviously because we're waiting James Gunn um, and so like yesterday I like I you know I get like three or four Twitter Twitter things like two from Nick news um, articles or whatever and then it was like James Gunn tweets I was like Ooh, click oh it's just a promotional thing about Adam out, out Warlock I don't care I know I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's always that those false alarms yeah absolutely uh, but I haven't really like been utterly done much this week. I mean, I've, I've, if you follow me on Instagram, I've finished a book this past week and started a new one. So we're just out here being nerds, I guess. <laughs> are, are you watching anything? Um, there's a, a couple things I think we'll talk about here. Um, one thing I watched this week that will get discussed down on the podcast le um, level, but on a solo video. Uh, got start, wrote the script for the next uh, Classics Corner video, so there we go. Uh, but then also like watched you know like the rest of the country watched the first episode of Last of Us, um, fantastic. Uh, and then <laughs> for no reason other than I was like happened to be on Disney Plus and like decided to, like you know I haven't watched that in a while. Um, I watched the animated <laughs> uh, Robin Hood. <laughs> yeah, because like the Oodle Lolly, Oodle Lolly, Jolly, what a day! Or something. I was just like, oh yeah, this is this is so great. And just like marveled at like how they used to hand draw everything, and like it was there's like a lot of like motions that you was, like, mean copy from previous movies. So anyway, anyway, as uh, <laughs> as you can see, the side by side of Robin and Little John is the yes. exact same animation as Mowgli and Baloo from the Jungle yes. Book. I'm going. Oh, you... <laughs> interesting. I mean, yeah, they. It is what it is, but it's a good time. No, like I, I, that's it where it started for Josh. Like... That's where it started yeah, with yeah. the animal. <sighs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. In my head, I was like, I'm going to put this on the list, and I know he's going to bring it up, but I don't want it to. I don't want him to, but it's going to happen. 
uh, because also like now like my thoughts were like it'd be fun to get like a live action like a quote unquote live action Jungle Book style remake of that but then I was like mm. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. We did. We saw how how the uh, the, the American public um, reacted to Zootopia. I don't think we need something Zootopia. Like that. Uh, America liked Zootopia. It was cats. I thought you were going with like a cat. Oh no 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 no. Cat I mean, like, style oh, Robin Hood. Oh dear the, the, God. The amount of people that were like that fox is very attractive, and it's like yeah, you know what? Let's calm down, guys. Like calm, I'm like stop. calm the self, people. Y- y- yeah, yeah, chill out, chill. I know Miss Miss Hops is really attractive, but like, we don't need to say it out loud, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and if we weren't on list before, now we are. <laughs> I'm on a list. What about you? You watching anything this past week? Uh, I watched The Last of Us, but we'll get into that. We'll we'll devote yep, its yep, own yep. separate section of that. Like I said, it's a slow news week. Uh, I watched The Menu because it's now on HBO Max. Oh, yeah. Um. No, Josh, you are absolutely not right. It is not people eating people. Um, they oh. are they are still making actual like food and whatnot. Um, so basically, it's a whole bunch of people that like paid for this really really fancy extravagant dinner, and one girl played by Anya Taylor Joy, who just kind of happens to be brought along, but she wasn't part of the plan. So interesting. It, I think you would like it. Of its Ray Fines is basically like this, like the world's greatest chef, but there's more to him, and he's like super, super precise. Um, my professional stunt double Nicholas Holt is in it, and he <laughs> plays the role so perfectly of this dude that like is so obsessed with the world of cooking. He's just like he has, he's one of those just pretentious dickweeds that you're just like, ugh. That being said, <laughs> there's a scene with him in it and the chef that is so you get secondhand awkwardness from it's not like Scott's Tots level of awkwardness, but it's it's up there of just like you're cringing of just like oh um and Josh well, is breaking glad stuff. That, that, glad that water cup was empty. Yeah, chef. <laughs> um I think Josh will find it interesting for a movie, not because of the like the food service industry aspect of it, but more of it is blatantly a s- metaphor and symbolism for other industries. It's oh, okay. it's very much just a metaphor for how to partake in movies of just like is it okay to like analyze it from this aspect or sometimes do you just want a really really good like home style meal type of thing it's hmm. you, you get it pretty quick of yeah this movie's not about food at all is it <laughs> some critic hurt this director at some point and he was like i'm going to work through my issues here <laughs> um i think you would like it uh i don't think i need to see him multiple times i think once is enough of just like it's entertaining i don't feel like i need to own it i don't know if it lived up to the massive height that people were building up to be it's like oh yeah. it's one of the it's one of the sleeper movies of 2022 you really need to see it. so i was like there's some really good performances in it but at the same time i've come to expect really good performances from ray fines from Anya taylor joy from nicholas holt like i i've just come to expect yeah. that um john leguizamo's in it he's pretty funny it it's fine enough um but i'd say see it at least once and i think you'll get some enjoyment out of it but yeah there's 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 some good kills i'll say that there's definitely some kills in it and they're they do have some shock value to them but yeah i think last of us was the big thing that apparently a lot of people watched recently as it was like their second <laughs> most streamed thing ever i'm trying to think if i watched anything else uh, we've only got like six episodes left of Smallville, and I've told Heather since we started watching Smallville all the way back when it first started. I said, "You watch as soon as we start watching this, the day or two after we finish, they're gonna announce whatever the next Superman project is." And we are right on track for that. I, apparently, <laughs> sorry guys, clearly I'm what's holding up the James Gunn announcement. <laughs> <laughs> Hurry up, finish Smallville! Come on, man, what's wrong with you? <laughs> it is so. Here's the thing about Smallville, and I'll probably do a full video once I'm done with it. When it hits, it's really, really good, but it is so inconsistent. 
there's like some episodes where when it's good, it's great. And in the very next one, you'll have a girl that's possessed by an evil witch that she picked up while she was hitchhiking in France. You're just going, this is Smallville? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. But hey, Booster Gold's in the next episode, so I'll be curious about that. <laughs> Dude, that show like brings so many um how do, how do I say this? Um Walmart level <laughs> versions <laughs> of characters. It's, <laughs> oh, like, it's so true, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> like like the the version of Flash, the version of, of Cyborg. Cyborg's Alert the worst. Me. They did they do cyborg dirty. <sighs> They really do. Like Flash is actually the cool one of the coolest characters in the show, from what I remember at least. Maybe that's been di- it's different. I really like Talkman. Oh, I believe that. Yeah, I believe that too. Um, but yeah, it, it, like it feels so bad because like CW at least like tries to give them like accurate rep- representation, whereas like <laughs> Smallville does not care. Well, also <laughs> at all. And I'm sure when I do my video on it, I will. Put it in perspective, too. I'll try my best to put it in perspective. Of, look at when it came out. It was 2001. The only other superhero movie around that time was X-Men. We were still kind of in that coming out of the Batman and Robin era of don't acknowledge yeah. the source material. Don't acknowledge that it's a comic book property. Make it its own dark and gritty thing. Like, we don't want people in costumes. Like, the whole thing with Tom Welling was no flights, no tights. And I think that's to the detriment of the show, especially in the later seasons when you're just like, come on. You, you need to be moving more in this direction. But when it came out, we didn't have Superman Returns yet with Brandon Routh. We didn't even have the Dark Knight trilogy. We were still very much kind of in the we don't know where we are stage of comic book adaptation. So I kind of give them a little bit of slack because they kind of had to pave their own path. That's why they leaned so heavily on the Christopher Reeve Superman lore because at that point in time, it was the only Superman to work off of now. You have Henry Cavill, you got Tyler Hecklin with Superman and Lois coming back for season three. So I give him a little bit of slack because the superhero landscape in 01 was drastically different. The show aired before 9-11 for crying out loud. And I'm sure that I'm sure Jeez, I wouldn't be surprised. That's if that kind crazy of, to think about. I know. I wouldn't be surprised if that altered like some aspects of the show, too. But uh, anything else you watched or played recently, Josh? Um, I did re- remember that I, I started because of the announcement that the bear is getting a season two. I went ahead and rewatched, I think like episodes two, one through three, I think is where I'm at right now. But like, it's one of my favorite shows of last year. So like I could, for a lot of reasons and I, I could watch it over and over. So that's an easy one. Getting into our news during the Monday night football game, uh, which Thankfully, was a lot better than the college championship. Thankfully. Good. Anything better than 65 to 7 blowout. Uh, we got the Mandalorian Season 3 trailer that all of us were super excited. And I think, I don't know if Disney came out and said it, but I believe this is the final Mandalorian Season 3 trailer. I would hope so because it's coming out in March. Well, okay. I have many a thoughts on this. Yeah. I think this trailer is fine but not as good as i was kind of hoping for like i know people they were hyping it up of like all right man lloyd season three trailer and maybe i just kind of went in with too high of expectations but at the same time we're like a month and a half away from release i'm obviously going to be josh and i both are obviously going to be excited no matter what but i don't think this trailer does a good enough job of getting you hyped and that makes me kind of think that they're holding back a lot, which can be both good and bad. We've been we have no reason to doubt the people behind Mandalorian. But there to me at least, there wasn't a right hook in this trailer. Like normally a trailer leaves you with one big bop at the end of going, Wow, now I gotta see it. Ant Man and the Lost Quantumania showcasing how powerful Kang is towards the tail end of that trailer. Wow, and then you get that cool shot that Josh's gift to death of, like, Kang shooting the power blast or whatever. That looks cool. Yeah, it's cool seeing Grogu use the Force on some guy in the cave, but... Grogu Force-tossing some guy at the entrance of a cave is your is your hook? If it was the first time we'd ever seen Grogu use the Force, cool. That would have been a really cool thing to show in the trailer. But... 
Yeah, I think, no, I'm, I, I, yeah, I'm with you too, though, because I think the thing that got me too was he threw, he chucked him out, and I was like, oh, that's so cool. But then he like floats out like Professor X, and I was like, okay, <laughs> can't unsee see that cool. now. Yeah, a little less cool. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it also is like apparently we're uh, not going to have the Nebu Starfighter for very much longer either. Why do you say um, that? Because uh, at least the way that the scene scenes cut, the it seems like Mando is flying uh, that uh, like he's getting chased by those Tie Fighters. So it seems like he's getting a another a different ship. I don't. know. Maybe that's not him. I don't know. Well, I guess we'll find out. Obviously. I don't. I think they'll get rid of that ship so it's soon. It's too cool. I hope not. <laughs> I I don't think we'll get rid of it soon because merchandising opportunities. You got to make the Lego set Agreed. first before you blow it up. But also, he Please. just got it, and it fits so well for the evolution of the character of mm -hmm. going from a single piloted ship to a ship that's just perfect for him and Grogu. Uh, there is some cool stuff to be gleaned out of this, but honestly. The thing that made me the most excited was just seeing like those one or two shots of Coruscant going, yay, we're acknowledging the prequels again. <laughs> we had that weird stretch of time right around when the sequel trilogy was coming out some, from Force Awakens to most of um, Rise of Skywalker. Like the mainstream stuff, other than some of the animated shows, did not really acknowledge the prequels or they tried to minimize the prequels as much as possible. And I think we're slowly kind of getting back to that of like, Oh, a generation did grow up with the prequels, so they do have this appreciation for it. Maybe we should go back and revisit some stuff. Maybe, uh, like Thanos, maybe I judged you too harshly. Like, I still yeah. think the prequels get a bad rap from certain generations that wanted it to be the original trilogy. Are the prequels perfect? No. But at the same time, prequels did a perfect job of getting children invested in Star Wars, and heaven forbid, Star Wars be made for for children yeah say it yeah. together that's always been what it is just because you grew up you don't have you shouldn't expect Star Wars to grow up with you you can still like it just be open of okay maybe it maybe i outgrew this style and that's okay you could still like it but Star Wars is always made for children yes the mandalorian is more mature but getting back to the original point i i like seeing coruscant again but it's weird to me I'm still looking forward to Mandalorian season three, but I think it's weird to me that the thing that got me the most excited from the trailer was seeing Coruscant more than anything. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. There's a lot, I think in this trailer and that they're throwing a lot at you with no context. So it's not, it's not the, this isn't the part of the adventure that's going to be like, Oh, and they're here and they're here and they're here. Yay. Um, so I'm not a hundred percent sure where we're going. And I think that's why I'm not as hyped by this trailer. Like it looks cool. Everything looks like we're going to have a good time. I'm excited to get back to hanging out with Grogu, Grogu and Mando. Um, but at the same time, it's hard because after the events of Boba Fett, it does feel like we have two seasons of really cool character development. And now it's kind of like, okay, cool, but, like, him leaving doesn't actually mean anything now because first chance he got, he came back to Mando. So I I don't know, man. I'm I'm still a little on the fence about it. Uh, I am excited to see what Mandalore is going to look like. Um, I'm excited to see um, whatever that Jedi scene is. Um, That's a flashback, I, I think. I think so, too. Um, the question will be a flashback from who? Um, probably Order 66. It's probably the Jedi that got Grogu out. That is also probably true. I was thinking of a potential... I'm trying to think of how I how that would work, though. I was going to say, maybe it's a... Because that's also not like him. I was going to say, like a a Jedi killing section of the order 66 that was led by Thrawn. But um, I don't think that that's going to be the case now that I'm thinking about it in context. Um, however, I wouldn't be surprised if Thrawn shows up by the end of the show. Um, I just, I, I think part of this too, is that I am so mentally and emotionally ready 
for Grogu to not be a quote unquote baby. It's because she wanted um, to be a bounty hunter, dude. I mean, no, I'm okay. No, 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 no. Hear me out, hear me out. It's not even just that. It's that. And I guess, yeah, I guess that's leaning all the way into the Yoda stuff of like, just because he's small doesn't mean he's not powerful. But um, I think him like always hovering around in the chair feels like a cop out in some way of like, okay, cool. So now we don't have to puppeteer him as much um, because him looking, him walking was always a little weird. But um, at the same time, I... I don't know. I just I think I'm just ready to not have a baby that is somewhat useless. You, you know what I mean? Like he's all he's felt for two seasons like all right, cool. He has force abilities but doesn't know how to use them, which is odd. Um and then like there's just I I'm ready for him to not be a baby anymore. Regardless of what that means, um I'm just ready to move on from from that age from him. Do you you know what I mean? Yeah, I think also this trailer is hiding stuff from us because the first mm-hmm. two seasons of Mandalorian, there's this starter mission of what the story sets out to be, and then something gets revealed later on. Like, true season two, I feel like, didn't season two start with just with him, with Grogu, of needing to get something done, and then realizing, okay, we need to take him to a specific Jedi, which is where he meets mm-hmm. Ahsoka, and then that's kind of at the halfway point. Then we get Luke for the finale. I wouldn't be surprised if the whole I gotta go to Mandalore thing gets resolved in, like, the second or third episode, and that's kind of like, this was the thing, but then the real overarching thing that we've got to deal with here is uniting, like, the people of Mandalore, or... Yeah. That, yeah. like, threat that's being teased by the cop that he runs into for the first two seasons, which, you know, is obviously Thrawn. It's got to be Thrawn. Thrawn is what they're setting up. They tease Thrawn in season two with Ahsoka fighting um, in that one episode. And I'm sure Thrawn will be back for the Ahsoka show. I'm wondering how much Thrawn will factor into this. But also, I'm Pedro Pascal... While not saying what the surprises are, he said, hey, we kept Luke Skywalker secret from you guys in season two, so I have faith in our department that we can keep secrets. So, you know, whoever works over at Marvel, take some hints from the people over at Star Wars, because <laughs> Star Wars, for some reason, can keep their mouth shut, unlike the people over in the comic book industry. Um, yeah. But I'm still optimistic that I think season three will be great. I just think this trailer wasn't necessarily their best foot forward, is all I'm saying. Now, speaking of best foot forwards, on the other hand, holy crap, the first episode of HBO's The Last of Us is just, wow. So, okay, I don't say this lightly, I did not hate the Uncharted movie, I've made that well clear. However, after seeing the pilot for The Last of Us, I hate the Uncharted movie now. (laughs) This, this is how you, it makes all other adaptations of video game properties just look really, really stupid by comparison, because, y'all, I know some people are just like, do I need to, do I need to have played the Last of Us game to understand the show? No. But, if you're like me, who has played it over and over again, you'll get more appreciation of it. Like, I love that a good chunk of the dialogue is just ripped right out of the game of where'd you get the money for this? I sell drugs. I sell hard drugs. Oh good, you can help pay for the mortgage. Like that <laughs> made me so excited. Like <laughs> going, yes, you stole the dialogue. It is great. Um But at the same time they like flesh some things out more because they're gonna have this longer time. They got through a lot more in this first episode than I was expecting to. I thought the episode would would end with um, maybe Joel and Tess getting the mission to get Ellie or meeting Ellie for the first time. Or I thought the episode might even end with what happens to Sarah. I thought that might just be the end of like, well, this is what life was before. But no, we actually got pretty decently far for a first episode. Uh... I'll have more to say on it in a bit here, but Josh, as someone that hasn't actually played the games and was going at it from the perspective of just make this a good TV show, what did you think of this pilot episode for Last of Us? 
So, okay, to be fair, I have played, I've played the first like two hours, <laughs> two, three hours of The Last of Us, like three or four times, because I, I, I didn't own a game console for a long time. Uh, but so I was very, very f- like familiar with that, op- that, the legendary opening 15, 20 minutes. Um, golly, it is, I don't want to say shot for shot, because I, I don't know how you do a shot for shot with, a video game making comparison to a but movie. But they, they made it work in but some scenes. It is, oh, it is very close to some, like, to a shot for shot from game to movie. Uh, the, Sarah is so likable. So the, it, the only reason that I wasn't as in, emotionally invested in her as, you know, pro- probably could have been was because I played the game. It was because I knew her, what her fate was going to be. Um, but, like, because otherwise i would have probably cried i mean i still teared up even um whenever she she ends up getting killed but i golly man what a like you want to talk about like you were talking about best foot forward like goodness because you and i had talked um for uh, for months about okay how do you start this do you start them in the middle of the adventure do you even acknowledge the stairs the sarah stuff right off the bat because you got to acknowledge it eventually but like the amount of subtlety that they've been able to pack into this first episode is insane um the when joel is, uh, towards the end is protecting ellie for the first time and she like slinks in the background and the, the lightning hits. I was like, yo, okay, here we go. This is gonna so, be absolutely terrifying. So I'll I'll bring that up of so mild spoiler alert for people that haven't watched the first episode of Last of Us yet. The ending of the first episode for me was one of those times that they talked about that they were gonna change some stuff up, but I didn't know what they specifically meant for it. They changed something from the games, but I think for the context of the show and the emotional weight of it, they changed it for the better. So in the game, when Joel, Tess, and Ellie get pulled over by the cop, and he's like scanning to make sure that they're not sick or whatever, Ellie does stab the guy in the leg, um, and then Tess, I think, shoots him in the head, and then she sees that uh, Ellie is infected. But in the show... Joel kills the guy with his bare hands out of this like paternal f- PTSD flashback. Mm-hmm, I'm just going, mm-hmm. that works so much better. That that um that just flows and connects better. Also, I like the whole first half of it of seeing the world as it was before. Um, mm-hmm. okay, we've got to establish normalcy before we get to everything else. Um there's a couple times, I'm not gonna lie. If I closed my eyes, Joel and Tommy sounded just like the game, especially, yeah. especially yeah. Gabriel Luna as Tommy. Like when he's getting stuff out of the fridge, I'm going, that, that's Tommy's voice. Holy crap, that's Tommy. Um, but the, the biggest takeaway for me, and I know HBO was hyping it up leading up to it, but their dedication to physical stuff of props and yes. locations because... I do not get squeamish very often in horror properties. I almost vomited in this episode when we see the first infected, the grandma. Yes. Oh, hell no. Oh, Oh, dude. My gosh. Like, I'm now I'm squeamish about clickers and bloaters, what they're going to be like. Because when we see this infected person for the first time, no, just no. And the build up before of like the scene right before when she's tweaking out in the background, I'm just going, hey, dude, that looks like that scene from it. Chapter two with the naked grandma mm-hmm. in the background, except yep. better. Uh, <laughs> but just n- no, 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 yeah. no. And as somebody that like hasn't gone super deep into the lore of The Last of Us because I haven't finished the game. um the idea that they establish the opening like the opening uh, monologue is so interesting like i would have watched that on its own um but like the idea of what makes this these kinds of zombies different from any other zombie that we that we have seen before um to the point even to the point of 
when we see the grandma and she's finally, it's our first time seeing an infected and she's not trying to eat the, um, her daughter. She's trying to transfer the, 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 the fungus to her blown away. So cool. Even to the point where we finally, the first time we get literally a few minutes later, when we Joel gets chased for the first time by one of them, terrified, absolutely terrified, not ready and for it's... clickers, not ready for anything. Um, there, and this is hilarious because this is such like a Josh is on Twitter now thing. But um, what's interesting is after this premiere, uh, The Walking Dead's like new like side. Uh, uh, like show was like guys you, you were so excited well our new walkers are going to be more disgusting and terrifying than ever and we're like okay timing yeah. is weird buddy okay it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't matter if you make it gross you have to establish what the norm is to make it mm-hmm. i've i love that they're like yeah we're actually going to tone down the violence for the show that way when the violence does hit it's brutal like when joel kills the guy at the end of the episode that hits so much more because we haven't seen a whole lot of actual, like, fighting so far. I also yeah. appreciate, again, change from the game to the movie. At the beginning, the first time Joel comes across an infected, he just kind of pops him a couple times with a handgun, like a small little revolver or something. And this, like, took a, he basically swung a big old heavy wrench going, oh, mm-hmm. oh, okay. It's another detail that maybe I'm reading too much into this and maybe that's not what actually happening but i love that uh joel looks older naturally because it's been 20 years Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but he's got this gray one because of time but i also think he's got the gray because of his job basically being surrounded by ash all the time that's a bunch of ash in his hair not just gray i'm going oh that's a that's a nice touch um dude talk about stuff that is so heartbreaking like them like i love it would have been so easy for them to be like, all right, introduce this kid. He's going to be a, um, a, a, a information vehicle. Cause he's going to get, you know, taken to this, to this safe haven, to this quarantine zone. And either going to take care of them and he's going to give them news about the outside world, but that's not what ends up happening. And it's so heartbreaking. It um, reminded so- me a little bit of Jojo rabbit. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think one of the other two little changes from the game to the movie, uh, to the show, I guess, uh, is basically whenever um, whenever Sarah gets shot, it kind of like, it cuts to title, if I remember right. Uh, so, no, but you linger on it for a little bit at least. Not as, yeah, but not as long as they linger in, on it in the show. Um, golly, like, Again, I, I, if I didn't know that she was gonna ha- gonna end up dying anyway, I would have been heartbroken. If whenever they with the, that whole scene, I was still tearing up because, gosh, Pedro Pascal is so good. Like, come on, oh, he's excellent. I'm, oh, he's perfect. Bring on, zombie daddy. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, transitioning from zombie daddy to bat daddy, and <laughs> let's just stop with the daddy trap. I, I don't, I don't get it. Uh, Matt Reeves, the director of one of the best movies of last year, The Batman, has come out and give us a little bit of an update on The Batman Two. Matt has come out and said that he is hard at work working on the script, so we're probably a long way off from any official yep. news from it. But he's also said that. Uh, he's meeting with James Gunn and Peter Safran in a couple weeks just to kind of go over what the future of his Batverse is. And I'm sure they're going to give little details of what their plan is, but only stuff he needs to know because I'm sure they're playing it close to the best. Um, I really, really like hearing this. One, because I just like hearing people just rally. It's like, oh, yeah, uh, I'm supportive of whatever they're doing. They're supportive of whatever I'm doing. Mm-hmm. But... I like that James Gunn, Peter Stafford, and Matt Reeves are having these discussions because, one, to me, this confirms that this will continue to stay its own pocket universe. Um, I would not be surprised at all if James Gunn is fully willing to embrace a multiverse concept of, like, yeah, we've got our core stuff, but we've also got these side stories. We've got Matt Reeves, Batman. Um, It also means that Matt Reeves, James Gunn, Peter Saffron 
are communicating to not get their wires crossed. It's not going to be a Sony and MCU situation mm-hmm. of like MCU has a well orchestrated mapped out plan and Sony's just going, "Oh, um, you you guys did that in your movie, but that kind of conflicts with this thing that we did. You know how Morbius we we want to make a Morbius." But uh, can we use Vulture? We know it doesn't really make sense, but uh, can, can we use him? No? We'll do it anyway, whether it makes sense or not. We're, we're just going to kind of haphazardly... I'm not saying Matt Reeves would do that or James Gunn would do that. I appreciate that how I'm interpreting this is James Gunn's going, okay, your next three or four movies, what characters are you looking at? Are you looking at a Robin? Are you looking at a Mr. Freeze, a Bane, a Clayface? Who are you looking at? That way I can be hands off and not use those characters let's not overexpose certain characters batman and his supporting characters have a vast catalog let's not step on each other's toes here and i think that's really really smart that's good foresight of if matt reeves says i want to do robin in my next movie with mr freeze and two-face and then james gunn could be like cool then i'll do clayface and man bat in my next movie um, so on and so forth. What a combo. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> clay bat. <gasps> Man bat just hovers above the city and they drop bits of clay on people. Oh, uh, clay, clay, clay bat, bat clay. Yes. Clay face. Fa- bat face. Yes. Bat face. <laughs> yes. That's the new villain. Bat face. But to me, this means, okay. Either the James Gunn universe or the Matt Reeves universe somebody gonna give us the robin somebody will yeah and i think this that obviously that's all that matters to me but i think (laughs) it's it's one of those they're just like okay if you're not using these characters then i will type of situation let i i think james gunn will give matt reeves the preference of okay you started this first you can pick specific characters that you want to use give me the broad overall projection that you want to take and i'll go a different direction i Maybe James Gunn already has a couple ideas of where he wants to go, but I think he just doesn't want to get his wires crossed with Matt Reeves. I think that's a really, really smart idea and some foresight that has not been in Warner Brothers in the past. Agreed. And I, I think something that's awesome too is to hear that in in a sort of a way that kind of confirms to us the fans that the Batman series is not going anywhere. Um, as far as like it's not gonna be one of the it's not gonna go the way of Batgirl. Mainly because it sounds like it's a Batgirl was a terrible movie, but that's not the point. Um th- I am intrigued to see what Matt end up ends up doing in, in two. Um it will be interesting to see, and I think one of the this is part of the reason he's they're meeting with James is definitely to see if Battenson ends up in the in the core storyline um because he's self-contained enough right now that it totally works um i i just i i don't know if that's as as it st- stands right now i don't know if that's something i necessarily want but it, it it undoubtedly is a part of the conversation. Um, th- something Matt also said was that he that the the Penguin series is going to end up connecting to the movie. So that's un- again so awesome to that that this isn't another situation where Marvel is telling us yeah 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 those Netflix shows they connect to uh, they connect to the, the the universe we're currently building yeah, that, that that they exist in the same thing yeah 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 and then they don't end up connecting. So it, it's good to know that. While I don't think Penguin is going to be "quote unquote" required viewing, because I think Matt is smarter than that, um, I do think it's going to be like supplemental stuff. Like, oh, that's we don't we didn't necessarily need that to tell the main story, but that's good to know. It's a great time. Thank you for that side quest kind of situation. Uh, what I could see is like it kind of gives you. It gets Penguin to the level that we've come to expect from the Penguin character yeah, from the comics. Yeah, so maybe like by the end of the show. One of my favorite design choices that I've ever seen in Batman media for the Penguin is in Arkham City. His monocle is like the butt of a glass that's been pressed mm-hmm. into his eye that like he can't remove. I think that's super, super cool. I would love that if like some villain or some other mobster like betrays Cobblepot. And does that to him or something. Um, mm-hmm. 
Uh, I think this could be like a turf war situation here of like some other. We, well, we had both both Falcone and did we have Maroni? I think we did. Um, they mentioned knowledge, Maroni. No. Yeah, but he's not in there. I think it's just Falcone. Yeah, maybe have Maroni in there. Um, I think the Penguin series is going to be more just now that Riddler has royally effed up Gotham, literally. Mm -hmm. Um. What does Gotham look like now? Because they, they show that Penguin's like will be very much looking forward to taking up and grabbing up as much as he can. I know some people are already going, we're going with a no man's land situation. I mean, that's that very well could be a possibility. I know I floated out the idea of uh, Mr. Freeze would be great of all this water of literally freeze Gotham now. Um, I don't know if Penguin... Go for There's it. also that fan, that fan fo uh, poster you sent me of um, Killer Croc being involved now oh, too, which is yeah. with all again circling back. All that water makes sense. So it's I, there's a lot of possibilities going forward that I think Matt is going to really be able to lean into. But yeah, I, I agree with you. Of I hope one, it's a good show, but two, it's it's supplementary but not required viewing. Like Marvel's gotten yes. to the phase of certain shows, you don't know if it's required viewing or not. Like we joked with uh, Miss Marvel, we'd be like, "You watch because it's the show that feels like it's not going to have any consequences. It's going to be the one that has the biggest ramifications for the MCU going forward." And what do we know? They say mutant for the first time on that show, shaking the foundation of the MCU. Shocker! Yep. It makes it required viewing. I'm hoping the Penguins series is great. I think it will be. Just hope it's not required viewing, and I'm very curious to see what it means by bridging the gaps between the movies. That being said, the Batman I still think is pretty far out. If it came out in 2022, don't expect the Batman 2 until 2024, 2025. Like, December yeah, 2024 agree. at the earliest. I, I would say summer 2025, like June or July 2025. Um, Don't expect any casting until... Maybe the end of this year, beginning of next year, when, in which case they'll cast Noah Jupe as Robin, please, or <laughs> Robin and uh, James. I okay. I actually think I would rather have now that we have an alternative. I as much as I'm looking forward to the Reeves verse, I would much rather Robin show up in whatever James Gunn is planning because the Battinson movies are very much like that grounded, serious take and. I don't know if you can be true to the Dick Grayson character or give him the proper arc that I would like to see in the in the world that they're building. And I think James Gunn is much more just like, no, no, no. We'll embrace the elaborate weird stuff. I put Starro in my last movie for crying out loud. <laughs> so I'm I'm looking forward to this, but I I think this is just good. This is cl good clarity that's been missing from Warner Brothers for quite a long time. Now, lastly, for our news, um, just talked about Warner Brothers having clarity, like they're looking to sell some other pieces off. I thought we were moving past the selling phase, but I guess not, as Warner Brothers Discovery is interested in selling off their entire music library, to which maybe it's just because of my job or whatever else. But my immediate reaction is, whoa, 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 hold up a minute. Let's get some clarification. Let's take a step back. Bros. Discovery hasn't made an official announcement or anything. Are they looking to sell or are they looking to license the music? Because mm, there yeah, is key. a drastic difference there. There is a huge difference. Uh, so supposedly the music library is estimated to be worth around a billion dollars. And I believe it. Um, and also people are just like, what? Why would you sell your music? Well, actually, Time Warner already sold the music division back in 2004, <laughs> but they still hold like the rights and everything to music and whatnot. Um, licensing, if you haven't been paying attention lately, licensing is kind of a big deal in the world today. Uh, so what's the difference yeah. between selling something and licensing something? Um, selling something means you're buying it out wholesale. You, you completely own that thing. Whereas licensing is kind of like when you buy or rent a movie digitally. You're getting it through a service. That service could take away that thing at any time. You were buying 
the rights to that thing in a specific capacity. Like, I work in licensing of people will say, I would like to use this video clip for this commercial or for this movie. And then you find out a price, you use it for that purpose, whatever. Um, Horror Nights, Josh Knight's favorite event. You have to use a license, even if Universal is making it a haunted house based off a movie that they themselves made, it is still a license that has to be paid out to somebody. It's still a process to get that done. There is a big difference between selling and licensing. I have not seen the clarification of whether or not they're selling or licensing. That, so let's hold off on that. Why would they be doing this? I'll be honest, I have no idea. Um, I thought they were done <laughs> selling stuff. I thought they were done for the time being. But uh, I don't know. This is this is weird. Josh, before I go into some other thoughts, what do you think about Warner potentially selling off their entire music library? I mean, it's it's tough not to raise an eyebrow at a music library that's worth almost a billion dollars. Like two, two billion. Two, two billion. No, no, is it like, is it one or two billion? I think it's. Oh, one. you're asking the wrong guy about that oh, one. Oh no, pal. you're. you're be, Josh was right. It was one billion. <laughs> uh, but like, it, it, I'm with you. Is one of those like, okay, I thought we were done selling everything off. I don't know how this necessarily benefits you guys. Um, I don't know because. How, how this this is where like copyright law and licensing gets all super muddy because like is this like the Warner music stuff like that's artists and it's not like we're not talking like movie uh, movie scores or anything like that we're talking like I don't I I don't know who who was un, under label for Warner Music Group but like let's say like I don't know but Blink One Eighty Two I don't think that's the case but still like yeah. it's. Like, do are they selling a library that has you know Blink One Eighty Two in it? Like, I, it's not very clear as far as like what is all in the library. What, who, wh why are you selling it? Uh, what will how will that the selling of the library affect the people that have songs in the library? Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it's, yeah. it's very confusing. It's very sus. Well, also. It, they're not the first ones to be doing this. I know a lot of older musicians that have vast catalogs have been doing the same thing. I feel like uh, the other week or two, I feel like Dr. Dre sold off his music library. I wouldn't be surprised if Rolling Stone did it. There's definitely like some older artists out there that have sold it. And I think it's just get that one big, huge paycheck. Uh, but again, is it selling it? Is it licensing it out? And my other big question is, who would potentially be in the market for this? And what would the uses for it be? Just because, like, my first thought is, like, Apple, maybe? But then again, what would Apple do with it? Like, the exclusive home of the Harry Potter soundtracks and the original Superman theme <laughs> only on Apple Music. And everyone's just going, okay, he's still not going to get us to sign up for title, but whatever. Like I yeah, like it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's this is weird to me, and I know they still have a bunch of debt that they need to wipe off their ledger. Quoting Black Widow there, but it, yeah, this is an odd Ooh. move to me. It's just uh, okay. This this is one of those like we're we're talking about now. One because it's low news week, and two, it's like a let's let's just let's just put a pin on this. We'll we'll circle back to this when it becomes a bigger issue down the road. Yeah, I agree. I'm trying to like Google, do some quick Googles just to kind of see if there's anything. Some quick Googles. Yeah. <laughs> see if there's anything that like makes sense. And I'm I'm not necessarily, and maybe this is just because I'm, you know, I don't have a lot. I, I don't have a lot of time here to, to look into it, but it's just, it, it's very confusing as far as what the, what is in the library, what all, who, who would even want this? Like, I don't understand the point. Like it's whatever, dude. Put a pin in it. <laughs>
Well, if you don't understand the point, you need a nice cup of coffee to wake yourself up. Drink that coffee in an Uncharted Media cup. Or wear a nice Uncharted Media hoodie while you think and ponder life's great questions. Or if you have the answers to life's great questions, but you don't know how to explain it and you think it's just a wild theory, you need a tinfoil hat theory shirt to go along with those crazy ideas. All of those and more can be in the Uncharted Media shop on T Public. Go to the link in the description. Support the show. My greatest plug of all time. Somebody boo this man. <laughs> well, speaking of boo, not all movies are that great, but sometimes they're great to look at. So this week we're gonna look at the best. Yeah, we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at the best looking movies again. These. Most of these are great movies. Some of these are just okay movies that happen to be really, really pretty. Like, again, this is a lot of different caveats to this. It could be great cinematography, great with production design, great lighting, all coming together to create one cohesive, ooh, that's pretty looking thing. Josh, yeah. how many movies do you have? Uh, 12. Oh, cool. Uh, I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, <laughs> I like eight, how we nine. Don't count ahead of time. Nine. <laughs> it's because, again, we have one brain that just gets shuffled between the two of us. So we're normally yes, in yes, the, around the same ballpark, except for, you know, I'm most anticipated, in which case you put 12 in your honorable mentions list. So what are you, a letter, BuzzFeed right? article? <laughs> so I do want to get some some ones out of the way, uh, and this is just because we talk about these movies. I talk about these movies so much. Uh, let's get How to Train Your Dragon out of the way. We'll yes. get Kung Fu Panda out of the way, and Blade Runner twenty forty nine. I talk about them all the time. I do not. I'm not going to bring them up outside of this section. They're all three of them are fantastic f franchises. Beautiful. Um, you and on top of being fantastic movies are incredible to look at so now we can continue because <laughs> i was like i want to get these out of the way because i know i don't want to like dedicate any more time to that we already talk about them so i already i already looked ahead i only have three comic book movies and okay almost all of them are dc almost um but yeah i i have a lot of recent stuff and that's maybe just yeah. because I think as we progress, we get more advanced ways of shooting stuff that can be yeah. really, really fascinating to look at. And just we we get better at creating visually striking imagery. Uh, don't get me wrong. As much as I love Star Wars, the original cinematography for that original trilogy is just kind of pretty straightforward. It's yeah, it's whatever. Um, OK, let's start with the Batman. That was kind of what okay. started this discussion, yeah. because. I'll go on record. As much as Mask of the Phantasm is still my favorite Batman movie of all time so far, I think The Batman is the most visually interesting of all the Batman movies we've ever gotten. Um, Christopher Nolan's, like, is very yeah. much grounded in that reality. Like, he's looking wrong. He's got some really great shots. You got that iconic shot of Batman sitting on top of the rubble in the Dark Knight. Um, of course. You've got Joel Schumacher's very distinct vision for Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. Um, but there are so many shots in the Batman that are just cinematic excellence of you could take a snapshot Agreed. and frame it somewhere of, I love how they use the volume. So they use the same technology from the Mandalorian for a lot of the backdrops, but they understood that you need to light your subject well, as well as having the volume. So like when it's sundown and God, that sundown looks so gorgeous. Um, but they light the subject properly uh, that mm -hmm. nice shot of him overlooking the city as sun is coming down um, or when he's on top of the GCPD and Catwoman comes out of the shadow, I'm going, ooh, that's a pretty shot. Or um, probably my favorite shot of the whole movie is when you get that um, God angle when you're top down looking down of him with the flare leading the people yeah. through the water. I'm just going, yeah, it's a metaphor. Yeah, I get it. You've made it so it's obvious that I I understood it. I, I got it. So thanks for making it pretty easy for me to follow there, Matt Reeves. Or even like when he's got the person in his arms and he's like walking from mm -hmm. right to left. I'm like, oh, that's that's beautiful. Or his introduction. Um, 
I just, the camera work is a big part of establishing the tone. I don't like the the term, but it sets the vibe pretty quickly for the Batman. Batman has a very distinct vibe, and that's kind of what we're looking for this list of, like, does the look of the movie give off of a specific vibe or energy? Very the, true. And the Batman has a vibe to it, and it is, you're about to be force-fed your own kneecaps in the name of peace. <laughs> Justice! <laughs> <laughs> like yeah it, it you were gonna be uh eating your own teeth here in the name of uh justice so uh have fun or uh, vengeance i guess yeah because he says home oh, vengeance um i am the knight i'm batman um yeah but i'm with you uh there's so many shots that i i just absolutely love um the, the way that they pull off the uh like in eye cameras the, is is so interesting to me um how they have characters interact in the uh in the, in the nightclub scene is super fascinating to me uh but yeah you've covered most of the fantastic shots in that movie it it, it is such a beautiful movie to look at first appearance uh, the, of, first appearance of the riddler yes oh when he's right behind so the good. guy oh so good. or when he's in the balcony uh, he, at the funeral <laughs> Mm. there or or like the uh the shot of the bat cave for the, when he's like gloomy and like on the computer like it's it's when so i good. was a young boy a young boy <laughs> my father took me into the city. uh <laughs> oh, all my chemical game. batman memes <laughs> or just, yeah there's just like uh, it's only gonna get better as the t- as the series goes obviously um hopefully he cuts his hair eventually and actually leaves the house um but yeah, I it, it it's very hard to to get better than that. Uh, I will say, I'm gonna go ahead and lean with something just as gritty, but kind of in a different vein. Um, let's talk about Seven. Um, the it is has a very, really yes. I I think if you only looked at the um, how do I want to say this? The kill shots uh, alone are just very well put together they're very like classic horror um even like the still of sloth like i've 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 was going back and just to kind of get a refresher on some of these movies the still that is like a wide shot of the room that sloth is sitting in or or even gluttony uh is it's terrifying and like it's ominous uh and that's not even bringing up the shots uh, from the finale of like those wides with all of the power lines and you have you know them being dwarfed by the it's just it's such an incredibly shot well done movie um i i it's been a while since i've watched it honestly but i wish i I'd probably go back and rewatch it but um yeah such a beautiful gorgeous movie to look to look at i think something that's very key here too is you should be able to see any shot from this movie and go oh yeah i know what that movie's from i know what that's from it's it's the it's the framed example so you got wordle and then there's a movie version of wordle called framed if you can get the framed version of this movie from one still image which also the day we're recording this today's framed spoiler alert is iron giant yeah I got it on the first one. Just saying. Wait, that's a thing? That's an actual game? Yeah. Just go to frame.com and it's it's like Wordle, except you get six frames from a movie to figure out what the movie is. <laughs> Josh, Josh knows what, what, I know what I'm doing later. Josh knows what his daily routine is going to be. <laughs> but yes, today's is Iron Giant and I can tell right away from the lighthouse. Um, Let's see. What do I got next? That could... F- all right, I'll just stick with the superhero stuff. I'll get my superhero stuff out of the okay, way. Okay, my okay. other DC related ones, because I am a simple, simple man. When I see bright colors, I get happy. I I like the the twinkling lights. I love me Aquaman from head to toe because okay, yeah. For so long, and I'm pointing the finger solely at the MCU. Um, superhero movies we're very much going for this like natural aesthetic of like, yes, we want these characters to feel like they live in the world that you live in. I'm going, nah, screw that, man. When I'm reading comic books, it is a bright, 
vivid picture. If I'm paying 25 to 40 bucks for a volume of comics, I want the colors <laughs> to leap off the page like it has been so highly saturated. I want it to be bright, splashy. I want a big dude to be jumping off the page. It's it's supposed to be otherworldly in Aquaman. It's not a perfect movie, but I have very rarely seen a comic book movie so readily embraced stylistically where it comes from in terms of being a comic book. Uh, the Suicide Squad maybe tops it just because the mm -hmm. Suicide Squad blatantly has like chapter breaks like you would in I issue of a comic. But Aquaman, wow, they oversaturate everything. I, I like bright, colorful stuff in movies. And I think we've kind of dulled our color palette in movies lately, which is weird because I'll praise a movie later. Uh, that has a very dull color palette, but I still think it's a very beautiful movie um, and it looks great. But I think we need more color in movies again. And Aquaman is just like, yeah, Amber Heard may be crazy, <laughs> but we're going to give her the reddest hair you have ever seen in your life. Oh, Aquaman has a gold and green suit in the comics. You don't think we can pull that off? Boom. I don't care if you think we pull it off or not. It's a golden green suit, and it looks gorgeous. <laughs> We're going to have colors, but the shots look great. The one that always jumps out to me is when uh, Arthur and Mara dive into the water when the trench is following behind them, and the one little mm. red light slowly descending into the dark. Um, or when Arthur comes riding um, Julie Andrews into battle, and he like raises his pitchfork or whatever. Also. Yeah, if you haven't seen Aquaman, you're just going, wait, wait, what? Yeah, <laughs> he just rides an angry Julie Andrews into battle for for Atlantis. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> it is hard to beat, though. Yeah, because that I remember seeing. Did they show the? They didn't show the king suit in the in no. the trip. No, they did not. They kept that no, close to didn't. the chest, which thank God. I, thank goodness, because I remember seeing it then for the first time and theaters are going, yo, they did it. Holy cow. Like, that's cr what they pulled. They, they they were like, you know what? Let's go for it. Um, fantastic. Very bright and colorful movie. Something that I agree that superhero movies tend to not want to do. Um for better or for worse, Zack Snyder's movies are are over, are overly saturated. No, they're overly desaturated. He he's allergic yeah. to color. He is Man of Steel. Um, I don't understand why it's so hard to do blue and red. Oh my gosh! Anyway, conversation for another day. I love Man uh, of Steel, but uh, uh, <laughs> the color palette in that movie still bothers me. I know it's a per personal preference, but whatever. Ooh, okay. Thank you for the segue. Let's talk about a movie that bothers you, but I love, but you cannot deny is beautiful to look at. Scott Pilgrim versus the world is yeah. an is incredibly visually interesting movie, uh, regardless of the fact that Scott is kind of a terrible human being. Kind of. Uh, ki kinda. He's, he's honestly just like a regular straight white male in, in Canada, and that's just how it is. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry to our Canadian audience. <laughs> nah, screw you guys. <laughs> That's, I'm kidding. I, yeah, no. Nah, screw I, you, eh? <laughs> screw you, eh, man? <laughs> there, all of a sudden, oh. we're going to get an army of angry Canadians riding their moose in, coming to Josh's door, <laughs> and throwing Honestly? maple syrup jars at him <laughs> with hockey sticks ready for battle. <laughs> A polite <laughs> off. Hey, we're offended, eh? I uh, honestly, I'd be more impressed than mad <laughs> with that line from from Anchorman. I'm not even mad. I'm just impressed. Um, but yeah, Scott Pilgrim versus the World is so visually interesting. I love that the visuals, quote unquote, change from section of the story that you're in. Um, you know, uh, the the section with chris evans where he's a, he's a movie star is intentionally shot in a very like quote unquote big cinematic way um as opposed to in comparison to what literally happened five minutes before that which was a dance battle with a, a demon lord in the middle of a of a, of a music video so like it, it is incredible regardless of your your opinion of the film 
Um, it is a visually interesting movie. <laughs> that is very, very true. And it's also fits perfectly still because Scott Pilgrim vs. the World based off a comic book. So Yes, agreed. Uh, my last comic book one. So many people, myself included, when this movie came out, didn't know it was actually based off a comic book. And Marvel's going, no, no, we we had it as a comic. We swear. It's just a very, very, very different team. The only animated movie I'm going to talk about today, Big Hero 6. Yeah. I love the visual style of Big Hero 6 so much. Even if it's nothing else, it's... what I could just put this on a list for when... Hero and Baymax fly for the first time. Yes. That's gorgeous. But I love the aesthetic of San Francisco. I think it's so visually interesting. Josh just loves the name San Francisco. <laughs> San Francisco. Uh, I love the design of it. I think it looks spectacular. I still think the design of the villain is one of the most underrated um, villain designs in any Disney movie with the, just the black trench coat and the... Um, Oh, what's the what's the name of that mask? Uh. It's been a while. It's been a while since I've seen it. So yeah, not... that mask looks great. Uh, all the character designs look excellent. But of like, oh, you 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 you've made art. It's art. I'm quoting Iron Giant here because of course I have to. <laughs> is after Hero and Big and Baymax fly for the first time when the two of them are just sitting next to each other on top of one of the blimps, staring off into the clouds. I'm just going. That honestly may be one of the most gorgeous things I have ever seen in an animated movie. Like that is, that's unfair how cool that looks. Um, it's the style is so distinctly San Francisco and Tokyo, San Francisco. <laughs> San Francisco. Like it, it, it just, <laughs> it works. I just the the detail is there, but also Disney also has this tendency in their recent movies to over detail things marvel especially has this problem with their costumes mm -hmm. big hero 6 i never feel like things are overly designed or overly animated if that makes sense i mean most of that energy was probably dedicated to the nanobots instead because oh i can't even imagine the render times on some of those scenes good lord um but it, i think it's the it sounds weird but it's the perfect amount of animated like there's some great detail but it's not overly detailed it mm -hmm. it's so unique i love the style so much um also i don't know if josh will bring it up today but i could just watch a screensaver of just treasure planet stuff yes um, oh maybe dude, yeah, maybe not some of the up, C, yeah. maybe not some of the cg because some of the cg is the only stuff that has aged itself a little little wonky yeah but like some of the matte paintings that they use is spectacular of uh, the greatest oh, um the greatest transition ever is when they basically just steal the DreamWorks logo of they're zooming into the moon and there's a city. I'm just going, hey, isn't that Wait DreamWorks? A <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, or even like when he opens the map for the first time, like, oh, dude. Mm -hmm. I, or the greatest oh match God. cut in the world. Dude, oh, let your spirit soar. Uh, I, could, I could talk about Treasure Planet all day, baby. Um, so I'll talk about... No, I was going to say my last <laughs> the animated. brain freeze I was, I was, there. I, I, no, I was going to say last animated, but then I looked at my list and I was like, mm, "There's a couple," um, but definitely my my last superhero movie. Um, I guess technically, uh, I wanted to bring up um, Spider Man into the Spider Verse. It's got the best shot, you know, the best shot in cinema. That lasts like three seconds. Like it, 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 visually, incredibly interesting. Um, the stuff that they do technically is so incredible and to the amount of very specific animation that they do is incredible like the way that they layer all of their colors they layer all of their scenes is inc just incredible to see um and maybe it's because like i I'm very. I've I've dived into the, uh, the behind the scenes quite a bit of, of the of the movie. So like I'm aware of the technical prowess that the artist and the amount of effort that the artist put into um, the movie itself. Um, but 
golly like even if you're only looking at and for those that don't know the the, the quote-unquote greatest shot in cinema history is that one the what's up he, danger shot the what's up danger shot um where he's falling but it, down down to the city but it's flipped to look like he's rising up um fantastic symbolism through 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 motion beautiful love it um i had brought it up briefly before we got on but you had said that you hadn't put on put it on your list for a reason so here's why i yes. love the visual style of another spider verse granted it did take, take me a little bit to get used to it also like aquaman even more so than aquaman actually it does feel like a living breathing comic book come to life mm -hmm. my only complaint with it and it's just like reading comic books is sometimes i feel like certain panels like a comic book are a little too busy for its own good fair of there's some shots the what's up danger shot perfect other shots are dense for the sake of being dense um and i'm worried that that'll be a a problem for across the spider verse like yeah it's like let's just put stuff here just because we know fans will dissect this and make youtube videos for months on end um yes by and large in the spider verse is gorgeous but other times i'm just like this is a very this is a very busy frame. As much as I love the Lego movie, I think the Lego movie also kind of suffers mm -hmm. from that of Agreed. putting so much frenetic energy and putting so much stuff on the screen that it could be a little disorienting. Um, I think Lego movie suffers from it a little bit more than mm -hmm. Into the Spider Verse, but I love Lego movie. I think that's also really really pretty to look at. Honorable mention there. I'm sure there's still people out there that think the Lego movie is stop motion. Um, mm -hmm. but it, that's well done. I just think <laughs> it's not, it's not. Can you imagine <laughs> how many Lego sets they would have had to do to make that is insane? See, like, and I grew up, but I grew up with the, their little program where like they sent you a camera and like software and like some, like a base set to make little stop motion videos, like with Lego sets that, that, dude, that is like one of the reasons I love to like create stuff. So like. Dude, stop motion animation Legos totally within the realm of possibilities. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just I think sometimes it's a little too dense for into the yeah. Spider Verse, and that's like reading a comic book. Of uh, sometimes you'll read something and you're just like, oh, that that page is very busy, or I don't like that particular artist style. And I like the style for the most part of Into the Spider Verse. I just think at times, eh, not done all. It, you could have toned it down a little bit. Now let's get to the graphic here. I talked about how much I love color and vibrancy and I want more of that and less natural mm -hmm. in movies. I want escapism. Let's talk about Mad Max and it's three colors yeah, that it has. Baby, let's go! It's what three colors. White, orange, or brown. Those are the only colors. <laughs> that being said, it's still so visually striking. Like you get that great shot of all the cars going into the Darude sandstorm. Uh, you get the guitarist playing the um, the flaming guitar in the front. You're just going. Which is a job I never knew I wanted until I saw it. <laughs> um, the guy that plays the guitar, the flaming guitar, needs to team up with the guy that plays the flaming tuba in Werewolf by Night. Oh, let's go. And make a big old flaming <laughs> band. Of, um, call it, call your band Great Balls of Fire. Let's. Flaming. I don't know. Yeah, there's something. I mean, the Great Balls of Fire thing is about, about as good as you're going to do. <laughs> but Josh, given that Mad Max is one of your movies as well. Oh, dude, I love Fury Road this specifically. Movie. Fury Road yes. specifically. Um, and I think part of that is just because George made the, George Miller made the other three with like $12. Um, they, they, they are interesting movies. The concepts are fascinating, but they are definitely a product of their time. Um, and the fact that George Miller didn't have any money. <laughs> um, but like Fury Road is so, I think to go back to your point about that, this movie has like three colors. Um, it uses that to its benefit though, because when you see water, finally, when you see green, it like in the plants that are on top of the, um, oh geez, what are they called? The, the, the the, the immortal joe immortal joe's you know base or whatever um it's striking and it's it kind of takes you for a second um but even like if we're not talking about like colors the shot selection the uh when they are chasing furiosa and max is 
quite literally chained to the front of one of their cars. Um, that crazy zoom in is, oh, it's so good. Even like the the uh, the follow shot through the caves when they're chasing Max after he, get, he gets away for the first time. Um, like incredible. Um, the, the, the sequence in which um they are running and the guys on the bikes are, are chasing, chasing them down so you have this like one solid shot of the main you know 18 wheeler coming through going through the mountains and then you have it's it's like going to like a, a like a like a like one of those like bmx shows just like bmx like like motorbike guys like flying over it's so cool uh it's just even if we're not talking about like colors and stuff like that uh it is such a visually the shot for me was that that legendary shot of for furiosa when she finds out that the green you know the green place isn't real uh, or it, it's it's you know been destroyed um oh and she just sinks into the sand and yells at the sky and it pan- you know the, it comes out and shows how small she looks in in, the, in these dunes of sand beautiful just gorgeous um let's see now for something kind of different but not um we talked about how <laughs> no, for something completely different Mad max Ray road has only like three colors this movie like aquaman the director was asked what colors do you want and he just goes yes <laughs> All of them. Um, sometimes I like to think in movies. Other times, I just want to see big things punch other big things. And no movie has done that with more flair and just looking super cool than Pacific Rim. Yes. Pacific Rim is like that movie whenever you go to like a Best Buy or Walmart and they're showcasing, look at how cool our TVs are. They'll probably be showing Pacific Rim of just like, <laughs> look yeah. at how black the blacks are. Look how bright the whites are. Look at the bright colors. And I'm just going, ooh, party colors. Ooh, he punched him with a rocket arm. Why didn't he use that before? <laughs> Don't question it. It's just fun. Um, <laughs> where where was that sword the whole movie? <laughs> wait, you have to reload a plasma cannon? Wait, what? Yes. <laughs> like, I, it shouldn't work. But it does. Even take away the the big fights, which I think are super bizarre that the biggest fight in the movie is in the middle. It's not at the end. Um, mm-hmm. But, like, the day-to-day stuff of, like, the military base that they live on looks spectacular. The whole opening fight of seeing the giant Jaeger in the snow. Um, even the finale and the fight at the end, I think, is a little underwhelming when they're in the Earth's core. But the... Nice contrast of the nice dark blue of the ocean and the bright orange of the sea depths. I'm like, oh, well, this is the color palette for Godzilla versus Kong. Those exact <laughs> colors, right down to the neon city that they fight in. Interesting. Which, yeah, which shout out to Kong versus um, versus Godzilla because that mm-hmm. is a v- visually beautiful movie as well. Especially like. Of course, you're gonna do the the last fight at, at, in in Tokyo at night. Like, of course. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, but Pacific Rim, I always just go, "Ooh, pretty colors." I like pretty colors and swords, and they use it well. But also, it knew how to shoot the stuff that it was presenting. Unlike Pacific Rim Uprising, in which case, just have them go fast and punch things. It's the same. No, these things have to move slowly. They have to be shown in specific ways to look cool and for us to actually be engaged in the action um but having the nice bright neon colors is kind of blade runner 2049-esque of like getting that nice i could always go for a nice neon aesthetic as we'll talk about later if used properly uh and i think pacific rim does it to great effect agreed i completely agree um Let's talk about something completely different. Uh, <laughs> Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Which you can, yeah. No, not really. A, it's average. Oof, excuse me. Very average, but it's average on purpose because it was made for $12. Um, that's my joke, apparently, this episode. Uh, let's talk about, because I, I, I brought up to you whether or not animation qualifies for this right and i i don't know why i was hesitant to, to say anything in animation but 
um, the more and more I thought about it, um, while you can bring up movies like Coco or or um, um, Encanto or like there or even Moana, but to me, Finding Nemo is easily one of the be- most beautiful movies Pixar has ever made. Absolutely. Um, Yes, the, it is. I would be remiss to bring, to not bring up Finding Nemo. The the absolute um, strides they made into creating a water environment uh, that that looks real, that doesn't feel fake. Uh, you know, animals that move how animals would actually move, but are still expressive at the same time. Um, the the shots of that always get me are the like even like that opening one where it kind of is that that wide of like where their how their their house is is in comparison to where the open sea is and it was just like wow or even those like for me it's always the wides that get me um at least in finding nemo because like there's that wide of when they're he's taking to uh um Nemo to school for the first time and you see on you know everybody's collecting to get on to Mr. Ray like the, the that wide is is incredible they the colors are vibrant and beautiful much like you would see in the actual reef like the, it is such a gorgeous movie and I mean it helps that it's absolutely uh well, easily one of the best movies they've ever made um but like genuinely from the music to the colors to the, the shot composition to the lighting, the Finding Nemo is an absolutely incredible, like very interesting to look at movie. I think also <laughs> Finding Nemo, even when I saw it for the first time as a kid in theaters, has a shot in it that I still put down as one of the greatest of all time in animation history. And it's after, um, uh, it's after Marlin and Dory think that Nemo has been flushed down the drain and so night yes. they're in nigel's mouth and he puts them back down but they like zoom out and it shows like basically like a pier it shows like some rocks and it shows the water mm-hmm. as a kid for the first time i thought they snuck in a live action shot in the movie yes because for 2003 those rocks and that water should not look as good as it does. Like, I understand landscapes are much easier to shoot than, like, people. But that looked so real. And I'm going, whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought this is animated. And still today, it holds up. I'm like, that's outstanding. Which, speaking of water, uh, I'm glad I remembered it. Now, Heather wanted to make sure we had an honorable mention here. And I completely agree of Moana. Moana yeah. is... Yep, 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 yep. Water has never looked better than it does in Moana going, that that's not fair. Moana is another like, yes, put all the colors, all the saturation, all the bright. Yes, please. I l- I, love Moana. I, I think you could say that, though, about most of Pixar's movies, even the ones that not everybody can kind of get or get behind. Like, even like Luke, Luca. Luca is, is yeah, incredibly looks pretty. beautiful and it's very well shot, well composed. Um, I, I, I think Pixar in general, at the very least, always has visually interesting movies, um, which is I, 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 that feels like a dig. Uh, but even like like again bringing up luca like even at pixar's worst they're still a good like, dinosaur the, yeah the, good the, dinosaurs their worst probably and that still looks yes. outstanding and it's still not even that bad of a movie it's not great but it's it's you know at least a dream dreamworks level uh, so <laughs> early dream let's oh, sorry let me tell you about early dreamworks <laughs> yes the ants, the ants era <laughs> so yeah oh god don't bring up ants oh my gosh <laughs> Yeah, Jeffrey Katzenberger did not do, was not very helpful for DreamWorks. Uh, so we're going to stick on the same similar uh, Finding Nemo train and take a hard U-turn and go with Tim Burton's <laughs> Sleepy Hollow. <laughs> because, you know. And now for something completely different. <laughs> we're just zigging and zagging all over the place. I will always be partial to a very, very specific aesthetic in movies. I know a lot of people hate um. Joe Johnson's 2010, The Wolfman. I don't care. I love it because it looks like a spoopy place. Like, the production design (laughs) on that movie is fantastic. 
But if the Wolfman was good, we'd call it Sleepy Hollow because Sleepy Hollow, it, again, I don't want to sound like the Steve Buscemi meme of, hello, fellow kids, but Sleepy Hollow has a vibe, man. <laughs> like, it's got a very, you know what I mean? I do. I do know what you mean. Like, I don't, I don't want to sound like the old guy here, but. But you're gonna. But I kind of have to for the sake of this. Like, it, Sleepy Hollow has a vibe, man. Like It does. I. If you put fog in your movie, it makes it 30% better. I don't under, I don't need the context of what fog is. I know John Carpenter did a movie <laughs> called The Fog. I don't know if that's good or not. But if you put fog in your movie, it helps. Rolling fog through a German village that's probably haunted by Christopher Walken. How is that not A-plus cinema? Like, it's got this gorgeous aesthetic the entire time. Great shot composition, especially that shot of Christopher Lee where he's got the uh, wings behind him and make him kind of look like a bat, which, you know, huh, it's an Easter egg. Get it? Because he played Dracula once. I'm going, yes, yes, Tim, we get you. I, we, I appreciate we get, we get it. it. We get it. <laughs> um, but I love the intentional choice for how much the red pops on the blood. Like, that's a very, that's an intentional choice being a hammer callback. The just the look and the aesthetic of Sleepy Hollow, I think, is fantastic. Like, I like Sleepy Hollow, but that's one of, like, I could watch on mute and still enjoy thoroughly. And I think that's a lot of these movies of, can you watch it on mute and just like the visuals? Just, like, have it on in the background and be like, ooh, that looks nice. That's a nice murder village. <laughs> ooh, pretty. <laughs> that's a nice murder and village. <laughs> you know, let's talk about a movie that's, at, to to be quite frank, is terrible. Uh, but is so gorgeous. Um, Oblivion <laughs> is... I'm glad you said it. I'm glad you is, said it. Is not a good movie, but looks like it should be. <laughs> it is visually so, like, narratively interesting. Like, even the things that, like, um, Tom has to... He, Tom Cruise's character has to kill. Uh, like, those little, like... I don't know what they're called, like... But they're they're like they got four legs and they're running around. They're terrifying. Um, so cool. It's the just the, the simple design of his ship is so cool. Uh, there's a tons of wides uh on in this movie that are like of his like home. Like so the 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 way that the light comes in through all of the windows, what the the stinking like swimming pool scene oh. where he's like like there's no reason for this to look as cool as it looks, but here we are. Uh, what's going on in the story? No clue. Is it interesting? No, no. not really, but here we are. <laughs> it's crazy to me. Um, Oblivion is directed by Joseph Kaczynski, who did the movie that I'm going to save for last, because I think Josh and I are on the same page with the same movie, uh, but he also did Top Gun Maverick, and Oblivion and this other movie are not on the same level as Top Gun Maverick. Don't get me wrong. Top Gun Maverick has some gorgeous shots. Like, the opening, I could just put all of the Dark Star scene on this of yes. he's the fastest man alive, and then it shows, like, that nice big old turn that he's made in the upper stratosphere and just going, oh, that's pretty. Um, Joseph Kaczynski has pretty movies. Oblivion is a pretty movie, but I still am just going... How did the guy that made Oblivion make Top Gun <laughs> Maverick? One of them has one of the most richly rewarding and compelling narratives I've seen in years, and the other one made Oblivion. <laughs> the other one's the other Oblivion. One Oblivion. <laughs> to which, like, if I didn't say on the podcast that I saw it, I would not have believed it because I've already forgotten more than I saw of the movie. Like, I forget so much of Oblivion already. Just like Harry Potter, it got obliviated out of my mind. Get um, out. Oh my gosh. So, my next one. I don't know if Josh has it on his list, but um, he'll follow the connection here. This movie is so good and it's so beautiful that the MCU basically just stole from it when they did Shang-Chi. Skyfall. Hey! <laughs> you know that hand-to-hand -hand fight from Shang-Chi? That's mm -hmm. absolutely just the hand-to-hand -hand fight from Skyfall in Hong Kong. Oh, wait. Is it Hong Kong? It's in a 
Eastern Asian city. Yeah, uh, somewhere along I those don't... lines. That fight. I don't know. <laughs> that uh, to me, that was one of the first times since I was still kind of a newer movie fan at the time, like really trying to hone in on just like, ooh, what makes good filmmaking? Watching that fight in Skyfall is just going. Okay, now that's cool. That that's that's well lit. That's that pretty colors. But take that section away, and you've got that totally ba shot of him coming in on a little boat with him dressed to the nines in the tuxedo. I'm just going. Okay, now that's a bond. Uh, <laughs> take that out. Uh, at the end, when they're back at the Bond estate, and the beautiful sweeping shots of. Like the fog rolling in over the hills. Once again, fog makes everything thirty percent better. Um, I, the, the where's that percentage coming from? <laughs> I got thirty-three to third percent chance of having fog, and the, I'm half the man that Samoa Joe is, which spells disaster for him at Skyfall. Um, there's gonna be like five people in the world that understand that reference or can parse that out. Um, but that great shot of when they burn his house down. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> Josh is hurting himself. Ow. Yeah, I'm fine. I can't hear you. Oh, ow. Right, the funny mode. Oh, okay. They call it that because it's funny for everybody else. Or like, so when the house is burning down and you get Silva, the bad guy, slowly like walking, walking away in silhouette. Josh is broken. Yeah, sorry, I muted my mic because I needed to cuss there for a second. Like, <laughs> oh golly, oof! But yeah, yeah, yeah. Skyfall's a gorgeous movie. We can, we 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 know that's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I got two left. How many more you got, Josh? I got I got three. So this will this will this will go pretty well here. Um, I want to talk about 1917. Um, for a movie that is quote unquote all one shot. Perfect segue. Skyfall was directed by the same guy that did 1917. Uh, yeah, I do that. I was uh, doing that on purpose. Uh, <laughs> We're professionals. <laughs> I know everything there is to know about movies. <laughs> what was uh, my, my Which is why movies. Josh's favorite movie is the one. <laughs> okay, look, it's not my favorite, but it's pretty good. All right, it's, it's it's up there. It's a great time. It was my first time ever experiencing like body double stuff, and I was like, "What? How is Jet Li in the same scene with Jet Li? This is crazy." Anyway, no, sorry. I'm not talking about the one we're talking about 1917 um the amount of shots in this uh, movie that made my jaw like stay on the floor is basically the whole movie uh, <laughs> like the uh the, I, the of course there's that one where he's running but like even before that there's uh where he's running through the there's a lot of running in this movie um he's running through the city at night while it's getting bombed so yeah all those flashes and oh it's so gorgeous um the what is it? i'm trying to there's a lot of there's a lot that happens um that they when they come across, across that abandoned house and uh, a plane gets shot down in front of them that scene is gorgeous there's there's so much about this film that is so gorgeous to look at. Like for a second, you forget. Oh yeah, there's um, there's people dying in this movie. This is a war movie. Oh, yeah, it's not. It's not necessarily uh, Steven Spielberg's level of war in uh, Saving Private Ryan, but it's definitely like a gorgeous film that uh, absolutely. It's one of those like. I'm not much of a war movie kind of guy. Um, I feel like this is the same story all the time. And, and it was just funny to say that knowing that I'm a comic book fan, but um, <laughs> uh, I just like that. I don't always like war movies. I guess I'm not that I haven't bought a pair of new balances yet. So I'm not an old man uh, quite <laughs> yet. I haven't, I haven't bought What's that? that com- the lawnmower three uh, thousands. That, yeah, that, that 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 commercial that's uh you know people buy houses and they turn into their parents um i'm not quite there yet i haven't picked up submarine books um <laughs> although i do find them interesting um you're still avoiding <laughs> john have, wayne movies <laughs> i i mostly because john wayne movies are trash Fight he's me. the same in every movie except for yeah. when he's racist and genghis khan <laughs> yeah that's the only time he's different um and he, he should not have been genghis khan to begin yes. with but wait, that was always a real quick rabbit trail here um 
one of the movies that is consistently on a bunch of people's like best cinematography kind of like lists is um oh crap i just lost it uh lands of arabia lawrence I think of arabia. Called. lawrence yeah. arabia and it's like mm, you know what i don't want to talk about that movie it's uh have you seen kinda, it mm, once a long time ago it's a very long movie <laughs> it's pretty to look at <laughs> but much like some of my ex-girlfriends just because you're pretty to look at doesn't make you interesting anyway um pretty sure they uh, said the same thing yeah 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 anyway 1917 is a gorgeous movie <laughs> hello darkness my old my friend, old friend. <laughs> what's your second to last one there josh Let's talk about my last quote unquote animation. Um, I say quote unquote because the fantastic Mr. Fox is stop motion. Um, visual, like if you want a movie that encapsulates the autumn mood, it is definitely the fantastic Mr. Fox. Uh, the oranges and dark browns, the uh, just it is such a it's a, I mean it's a Wes Anderson movie like you could easily just say hey let's uh let's put every Wes Anderson movie on this list uh because they're all have very distinct visual visualizations um the uh Life Aquatic should be on this list as well like gorgeous movie um absolutely insane but <laughs> gorgeous movie y'all want to see it. Bill Murray in a wetsuit <laughs> uh visually interesting uh moonrise kingdom visually interesting in its own very unique way uh grand budapest hotel obviously it won awards for a reason um it's there's wes anderson movies in general but i guess i wanted to specifically talk about um fantastic mr fox because of the amount of effort the wes anderson movies always have a lot of effort you can tell put into every single frame but because of the medium itself the fantastic mr fox obviously has a lot more work that goes into it be it being stop motion excuse me so like it fear is these wide shot i guess i think you and josh i josh like likes pretty shots wide something. shots i don't i don't understand josh likes uh, things but, that could be his wallpaper someday but i that's probably not far off from the truth actually now that i'm thinking about it uh but yeah no, i it, it is definitely one of those movies that like i appreciate you can see all the hairs moving i mean it's it's a kind of a thing that goes with um stop motion animation but uh geez honestly if i really wanted to i could take fantastic mr fox off of this list and put on get them all their solo toes um pinocchio it is absolutely visually stunning and absolute like there are two beings in that movie uh death and the i think she's like a forest fairy forest nymph or something like that the thing that that turns out that that brings pinocchio to life uh both of them have very specific designs but are so visually stunning for for a minute there you forget you're watching stop um stop motion uh, for a lot of that movie actually for Pinocchio de, de Toro's Pinocchio you forget you're watching stop motion it sometimes all of the how smooth everything moves you forget that it's stop motion and not hand-drawn animation it's incredible I'm so glad you brought up um Wes Anderson because my second to last one Grand Budapest Hotel yeah, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> I love that while the main storyline with um the Grand Budapest Hotel itself is very much like a storybook, all the different timelines, because technically there's three timelines in this movie, they all have their own very <laughs> distinct, unique style to them. Yeah. Um I it's like Grand Budapest Hotel is very hard to describe. It's like reading a children's pop up book or it's like eating like a really it's like cotton candy it's sweet and it's light and you like it but you probably can't take a whole lot of it in one sitting um so like i don't watch grand budapest all the time it's still probably my favorite wes anderson movie i like french dispatch too but uh grand budapest is probably still my favorite but i can't like always go back to it just because it's so distinctly grand budapest but honestly yes. any shot in that movie is just perfect. We already know Wes Anderson likes his symmetrical stuff, so it's all like nice and even and lined up. 
And you know me, I like nice, bright, saturated stuff. And mm-hmm. Grand Budapest is saturated. Holy crap. Uh, also, you had a movie where you chopped off Jeff Goldblum's fingers. That's 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 pretty funny to me. Um, <laughs> and probably the hardest I, besides what we do in the shadows, the hardest I ever laugh is always in Grand Budapest Hotel. A woman died in my hotel and you think I killed her. Runs away the opposite <laughs> direction, just straight back. Like, ah, physical comedy's great. It's like the joke in Monty Python. Uh, it's just perfect. The colors pop so much. It's all perfectly delicate. It's like one of those really, really well-crafted um, like cakes that you have really intricate designs on them. Like, oh, a lot of love and detail went into making this look specifically that it, the way it does. And that's, that's just Wes Anderson in a nutshell, almost to an annoying degree at times. It's just like, yeah. we get it. You're symmetrical. Um, that being said, I still would love it. If that SNL sketch came to life of Wes Anderson doing a slasher movie, I would, Dude. I would love that so much. Now, um, lastly, I'm pretty sure Josh and I both saved our last one because we talked very, very brief- briefly before it started. Uh, we talked about oblivion, with Joseph Kaczynski being beautiful and top gun Maverick being beautiful but that's not joseph kaczynski's most beautiful movie this movie's not his best by any stretch of the imagination (laughs) i got suckered in with arguably some of the best trailers ever made for tron Mm -hmm. legacy tron legacy had some gorgeous trailers i'm going i need to see this movie and i see it and it's gorgeous but I don't care what's happening on the screen, but it's gorgeous. <laughs> at least so I'm just going. So Joseph Kaczynski can direct pretty things, but he's got to have a really good script to work off of. I think is the thing. Cause I don't think Christopher McQuarrie wrote uh, Tron legacy. And I don't think he wrote oblivion. Uh, but I did notice last time I was at universal, uh, I was hanging around the horror makeup show and they have, a replica of the script for the 2017 Mummy with Tom Cruise. Apparently, that movie actually did have a script. Um, and there was like, <laughs> jeez, <laughs> ten to it was like ten to twelve people credited with writing and revisions. And Christopher McQuarrie is one of the names that helped revise the script. And going, oh, so Tom didn't trust you yet, Chris? I see. <laughs> um, Tom, from everything we've heard, Tom had way too much control over the Mummy, which <laughs> doesn't surprise me. Um, but Tron Legacy to me is still the quintessential. Holy balls, this movie's pretty, but I don't care if I'm basing a movie <laughs> off of just yeah. how pretty it looks and it's one of the best looking movies ever. Ron Legacy, hands down. And am I still a little annoyed that Disney Plus only has it in HD and hasn't bothered doing a 4K remaster? Absolutely, because I would love to see Tron Legacy in 4K with those colors. Oh my God. Yep. It's not my final, but yeah, Tron really? Legacy is is uh, is a gorgeous movie that nobody cares about. <laughs> I feel betrayed. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm the ro- I'm the rug puller now. Gotcha. Uh, this is gotcha comedy. Um, anyway, <laughs> the so my final is I guess technically I probably should have dropped this earlier because I talk about this movie a lot. It's gonna be doomed. Um, do if you are into sweeping shots of people getting off of uh, getting off of um, you like sand plates if you like sand, uh, but I mean okay, but like the but it's coarse and rough and it gets everywhere. The 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 wide shot Gosh, of, when, it. <laughs> of of it's the it's the of when the the sandworm comes out after they they make it to the to the rock and it's like staring them down. Gorgeous, terrifying. Any close up of of Zendaya and her blue eyes, gorgeous. Love it. I mean, but that might be because of Zendaya. But that's not the point. The uh, the just anything from their home world, uh, is gorgeous. Uh, the costuming, to so the shot composition. The Dune is an incredible film, shot so well. Um, and for a movie that is about a planet covered in sand, it does not let that stop it from being still visually interesting. 
Um, so take that, Star Wars. It's it's a lot like Mad Max. Of it doesn't have a lot of colors, but the colors that it does mm-hmm. have, it knows how to use them. Except there's exactly. there's less colors than Mad Max. They've got <laughs> they've got tan. Tan is the color. Hope you like tan and Zendaya's blue eyes. God. Okay. Whatever. But yeah, I I think while it doesn't have like a bunch of colors, it does have some fantastic visually striking shots of um what are the locust ship called? Like whenever those are flying, oh, I think those look it's like awesome. Dragon they're like the dragon flyers. We're or just gonna like call that. them dragon tails. Dragon Tales, Dragon Tales. We need a Dragon Tales movie, a live action Dragon Tales. Make them terrifying. No, that is horrifying. Make that, them terrifying. No, no it, it, we'll get that a- after we get a uh, Between the Lions movie. Oh, it's just, I'm technically that doesn't even re- even really make sense to make a movie out of. So they just eat the humans at the end. Between the lions, it's just a whole oh, bunch of lions man. just walking around a library, just hoping to eat somebody like Jumanji style. Like, and then he, it pounces on you, and you're like, "Oh no, I'm gonna die!" And then it's like, "Have you read this?" And he hands you like a copy of like, of like, of like, uh, an, like Animal Farm or something. And obviously, the bodyguard for this library has to be Gwen for Gwen's word. Gwen's word. Gwen's word. <laughs> It's a, wow. Now we know why y'all really keep coming back. It's for our <laughs> absurd Top- trains of thoughts. And yes, topical Top-tier references comedy, in 2023 going between the lines. And anybody bef- born after 2006 is just going, what? What is that? It's one of the best educational shows that ever existed, okay? It's just like, if we go a little bit earlier than that, just be like, yes, it's like Fraggle Rock. What? Like, you know, wishbone. <laughs> Dude, don't be careful what you say next, man. Dude, wishbone's fantastic. Although, Are you kidding me? Wishbone the, traumatized. The whole... Wishbone traumatized a whole generation of kids with that Sleepy Dude, Hollow episode. That Sleepy <laughs> Hollow episode, or even the this the Halloween centric episode, scared the absolute but Jesus out of me. Well, Terrified think, as a child. Well, I think scarier than that Wishbone episode was. Jekyll, Jekyll, hi, Jekyll, hi, hi, Jekyll, hi, Jekyll. Like, oh, dude. Um, brain, you're tweaking out a little bit here. <laughs> Which that actually means a lot of things in this context. Um, <laughs> now that we've gone completely <laughs> off the rails, what do you guys think? What are some of the best looking movies you've ever seen? This could be cinematography, production design, just in general. What movies do you just sit back and go, ooh? Um, let us know down in the comments below ways I came from you guys. And as always, if you haven't already, subscribe to us on whatever audio platform you're listening to us on, whether it's iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or YouTube. And if you haven't already, subscribe to us on YouTube and share us with your fellow movie fans. And as always, stay sharp, movie guys and gals.